Um, thank you very much for joining us. It's such a, a joy to see so many um, of you joining us today for this uh, wonderful conversation. My name is uh, Bianca Briccio and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Leadership, Ecology and Equity. Uh, we would like to start with a territorial acknowledgement. Kwe uh, Kakina, hello everyone. Hijashig, welcome. We would like to acknowledge that St. Paul University is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg people. We would like to honor the Anishinaabeg, the first peoples of the lands and waters of the Kichisibi from time immemorial. We acknowledge that the site of the city of Ottawa serves as the home of the Anishinaabeg as a place for spiritual ceremonies, cultural gatherings and exchanges among first peoples. Today, the spirit of peace and friendship is the foundation of relationships among Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples from around the globe. So I would like to take a minute to present this series, Being a Leader, Lunchtime Conversations. Uh, this series offers opportunities to reflect with organizational and community leaders around the challenges of social transformation in a complex world and to better appreciate the resources we can rely on to act within this world. It is organized by the School of Leadership, Ecology and Equity at St. Paul University. A few uh, reminders before we start, and uh, Gabrielle will share this information um, on the chat. You're welcome to uh, click on some of the links she's sharing. This conversation is recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel. We will be sending out uh, the link to the YouTube video after the event. We invite you to keep your webcam open. Um, only the videos of those speaking will be shared. Uh, please don't hesitate to send your questions or reflections throughout the conversation using the chat. Uh, we have some time for questions and answers following the conversation with our invited uh, leader today that we will have about 15, 20 minutes of uh, time for questions. I will now um, invite my colleague, uh, Professor Heather Eaton, to present our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. And welcome, everyone. It's so nice to see so many friends and colleagues, and it's lovely that you came today. So first, welcome. And an enormous thank you to my uh, colleague, and friend, Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker. I'm going to say a few things about her. Uh, so you need to know that Mary Evelyn has been, we have been colleagues for 30 years, Mary Evelyn and I, and friends, but Mary Evelyn's been doing this work for a long time, and the contributions are absolutely stellar. Uh, with her partner, John Grimm, <clears throat> They have been at the Yale Center for Environmental Justice, but they also have faculty at Yale University, also Bucknell. Uh, Mary Evelyn and John put together 10 conferences on the world religions and ecology, which came out with 10 volumes from Harvard. These were absolutely foundational books for the work in religion and ecology, the field that Mary Evelyn is a renowned leader. Her own PhD uh, comes from Columbia, and was on Confucianism. So she has a, a background in, and a, quite a bit of experience in China and Japan as well. She has co-authored, authored or edited over 20 books, including Ecology and Religion, including the Rutledge Handbook of Religion and Ecology, including being on the Orbis books for Ecology okay. and Justice. <laughs> Sorry, uh, okay, I'll just carry on. Um, has written quite a bit on Laudato Si. With her partner, John, she has put together six what we call massive open online courses on religion, various aspects of religion and ecology, including indigenous religions, Western, Asian. She has worked a great deal with the thought and project of Thomas Berry. Uh, with Brian Swim, Mary Evelyn, has created and produced a multimedia project, Journey of the Universe, which I know many of you are familiar with, which includes books and videos and films and di dialogue with scientists. Uh, Mary Evelyn has been involved in the drafting of the Earth Charter. This, by the way, is the resume I'm giving. Um, Mary Evelyn also has received over 100 awards from lectureships and fellowships has written well over 150 articles, 20 books, 
um, websites on Thomas Berry and Journey of the Universe. It is my absolute delight, Mary Evelyn, that you are here today and we're going to chat about you and being a leader. <laughs> Heather, that was such a gracious and incredible <laughs> introduction because I didn't even know some of the numbers there. Yeah, I but... counted. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you did. You're amazing. Well, you know, first of all, let me thank Heather for this invitation and her wonderful support, Gabriella and Bianca and so on. And I really want to give a huge shout out to Heather, especially for this new program that she's worked on for several years of leadership, ecology, and equity, a new master's program. We're coming up to Ottawa on March 22nd and 23rd to celebrate that. And I hope some of you may be able to come because it's an enormous achievement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this field of study, uh, has taken more than 25 years. And as Heather said, we've known her well before that. And now there are about 18 programs in North America, and we are thrilled to be adding 19 <laughs> from St. Paul's University. And I know that many of the nuns have supported this and other faculty and administrators. So congratulations to all of you at St. Paul's, and we're thrilled to be coming up there soon. So... I have a few questions, and this is a kind of conversation. Um, one question is, before you started all the work in religion and ecology, could you tell us a bit about your journey? Well, thank you. Um, it's, you know, I feel a lot of gratitude, really, and, and blessing, and that this work has been helped by the universe, really, but uh, by many, many friends and, and so on. And, you know, if we start and think about the different ages of becoming a leader, like Greta Thunberg and Keshav Khan Basu in Canada and uh, Vanessa Nakate in Africa, these young people who are coming up as leaders. And I started to think, all right, so my my little journey, um, I wanted to to reflect on it for this um, this discussion. So I just want to say the Holy Child nuns in high school were amazing in giving me a deep feeling of spirituality, you know, how to pray and how to pray with nature too, and also social justice. So that was an incredible foundation. And then at Trinity, I carried that social justice, Trinity being in Washington, D.C., to the civil rights movement, to the issues in the 60s and the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I went there to be active in these issues and it wasn't easy. Um, and in fact, it kind of led to burnout. But the other part of, of Trinity, it gave me a year of study in England and uh, study of art and history around Europe. And it also gave me the opportunity to go teach in Japan, which really changed my life. And that's where I read a lot of Thomas's work, 73, 74, and began to immerse myself in the Asian religions. So a lot of gratitude. And when I came back from Japan, I was so disoriented. And I wrote to Thomas in Japan, and I said, could I get a copy somehow of your book on Buddhism? And the miracle of my life is that he wrote back, you know, because I was just so burned out by the politics, so burned out by the spirituality that really didn't lift us into the spaces we needed to sustain ourselves. And so I just want to say the grounding of religion and ecology, as I'm sure you all know, begins, of course, with Teilhard de Chardin and his enormous sense of an evolutionary narrative that gives us human energy, a zest for life. And Thomas picked that up and just expanded it further and further. And of course, Journey of the Universe is deeply indebted to both of them. But that sensibility of we've got to have the human energy, we've got to have the spiritual verve um, and zest of this divine milieu, um, that was one of the great gifts of Thomas, along with, of course, the sense of urgency and a sense of what's ahead of us. And I think in terms of this leadership discussion, how are we going to manage? How do we manage that energy, love, zest for life? Thomas's laughter was just amazing and his prophetic voice. So that's 
kind of the grounding that led up to the Harvard conferences. And we can pick up uh, more of that, but just gratitude and uh, such joy of having met Thomas. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it was about this time, it was February 2nd, 1975, that I met him at the Riverdale Center, that uh, time of the transition between uh, solstice and equinox and bridges feast and candlemas. And I remember everything about the day. And my mother had <laughs> driven me over there the day before to, to, uh, to meet him. And I knew he was my teacher. So over to you again, Heather. <laughs> Thank you for that. So we're talking about Thomas Berry, in case uh, some of you are familiar with him. He was um, one of the geniuses of the 20th century, for sure. And he's the one who tuned our senses to understanding cosmogenesis and that we emerge from and belong to the universe, but also the creative energies of the universe. And I will say from knowing Mary Evelyn for a long time that she draws on those creative energies of the universe in all the all the work that she does. Uh, I just want to say a, a quick question, or ask a quick, quick question about, so with this background and this sensibility that you developed, what drew you to addressing re the role of religions and the ecological crisis? What drew you to that element? That work. Right. Um, well, so I began studying at Fordham with Thomas <clears throat> for my master's, and he did uh, this history of religions program. But it was even before that that my experience, of course, in Europe, you know, the great cathedrals and the religion is omnipresent in the art and so on. But in Asia, it just exploded for me that the cultural base and the, the spiritual pathways uh, across China and Japan and Southeast Asia of Buddhism, of Shinto, of Confucianism, and on and on, so intrigued me because it was so different from the West. And, you know, I studied at Sophia University in Tokyo, the Jesuit University, and um, truly immersed myself and had some extraordinary experiences, I must say, with um, Zen monks and so on and so forth. But so it was that experience, the cultural spiritual experience in Asia that certainly convinced me that these are traditions which are deeply woven into the natural world, um, that they're responsive to, resonant with, connected by great concentric circles like Confucianism of the human, of family, of society, of nature, and the cosmos itself. I was just blown away. You see, we didn't have that cosmic sensibility except for Teilhard and Thomas. So we just didn't have it. But the Asian religions, I'll just give one quick example and go back maybe to your next question. But, you know, I, every weekend I'd go up to Kyoto, which is to me still, I mean, Rome is amazing. Florence is amazing and so on. But I, I think Kyoto is probably the most spiritual city <laughs> in the world in certain ways. And in those days, this was 73, 74, you'd go into these temples, there's no admission. In the winter time, it was cold and, um, and just isolated. And you'd walk in and you'd feel the stones from these Zen gardens. You'd sense the moss, you'd experience the trees that are just placed in the right uh, area, pine trees and so on. So the stone and moss and trees rigged carefully. I'm sitting at the edge of the uh, Zen, Zendo, the place where you meditate. This was in the middle of winter. And all of a sudden it began to snow. I will never forget this experience of we live in such mystery and we are humans who can resonate with this mystery of all the elements and so on. They feed us. We know this. And so opening up those pathways um, to the deep sensibilities that every human has, uh, that we love the sunset, sunrise, and so on, that's what began uh, this path of trying to examine the different religions specifically for those sensibilities about nature and the earth. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> so you have a strong academic 
a career vocation, I would say more, and you have these deep sensibilities. Um, I want to take you back to uh, 2002 at an American Academy of Religion meeting in Toronto. And I, this is, Mary Evelyn was establishing the, what we, what we ended up, what, what she ended up calling the Forum of Religion and Ecology. And at this big meetings of the American Academy of Religion, we're talking like 8,000 people would come. And Mary Evelyn and John every year would host a luncheon. <clears throat> and this was the first lunch. And I had been working in the area for a while and trained as a kind of academic in the we get to criticize everything. We're not particularly constructive, but we're very critical. And so we had this meeting and people were new to the subject and they were saying things that I thought were not particularly riveting or intelligent. And after the meeting, I said to Mary Evelyn, why are you not criticizing what they're saying? And I don't know if you remember Mary Evelyn, you turned to me and you said, because I'm building a movement. <laughs> uh, First of all, that changed how I do academics. I don't do the slash and burn anymore, but you were building a movement. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Because now, as you said, there are all these 18, 19 programs, but a lot of this is because you built a movement, you and John and of course others. But would you like to talk a bit about the leadership of that? Well, what a great question and what a <laughs> great number of meetings have we've had with you at the American Academy of Religion, and we're always talking about this together. I, Heather is, I think, our very closest friend in this movement. I think Whitney Bauman is on this call, and he as well, and we can name others, but that those friends helped create the movement, is what I want to say. And scholars who got that this wasn't just scholarship, but we called it engaged scholarship, right? So, and that was hard for some people. Um, and uh, because the sense of objectivity, of critique, that's what we're trained for, was so dominant. But, you know, we had this sense Thomas Berry was already an engaged scholar, so we could see it there. And I didn't super consciously think all the time I'm creating a movement, but at the end of the Harvard conferences, the, one of them was the Islam conference, I believe it was in 98. And Sayyid Hussein Nas, one of the great, great leaders in this area, right, writing some of the very first books on Islam and ecology, Nas, N-A-S-R, sat down with us. And we were thinking with him, he was already a friend, wh how, what can we do, you know, in terms of these conferences and books and so on? And he says, you must create a field of study. So that became very clear, one of those electrifying moments. And a field of study would be incomplete without a force in the society. So that's the movement part. You know, we've got lots of amazing groups now, Green Faith and the Sisters of Earth and um, so on and so forth, that are doing the work of both protest and creation of positive examples of solar energy and on and on. So that field and force is something we were conscious about together. And I do feel, I'm glad you mentioned those lunches that we had. Um, and thanks to, you know, funders, we had these wonderful vegetarian lunches and we would have each person stand up and sort of say what you're doing. And the idea was to highlight and affirm individuals within a community so that they didn't feel isolated. And the other thing was to highlight and affirm an intergenerational handshake so that those scholars who were already mid-career, we didn't really have older scholars at the time, we were all kind of mid-career maybe of the people like uh, Whitney and, and Heather and ourselves, but it was to say to the next generation, this is your field as well. This is something you can create. And it, it was a very generative, positive atmosphere. So let me conclude by saying, I think one of the things I've tried to do over and over again is affirm, affirm people's scholarship, their movement. Um, you know, I, I might have critical comments privately with John, but for the most part, really trying to affirm. And I want to just say to conclude that, that you know, my family, my parents were very affirming as well of this movement. And I believe my sister, Anne, is on this. That kind of affirmation from her and my family has made a huge difference. 
I would just say being um, part of most of those conversations and conferences. And so what you just said, Mary Evelyn, to me is really important in the what I have observed as you as a leader is this affirmation. So I'm just like the others may not know, but we're talking thousands of people over 20 years or more that Mary Evelyn has been in contact with and always affirming. And this is to build a field which is now established. So it, can you say a little bit about the, um, I'm not sure how to phrase it, the qualities it takes to always be positive and affirming, even in the face of, you know, mediocrity or people, people struggling, but you were, you have always been very affirming. What does it take to be that kind of leader? What well, do you again, draw this, on in yourself? What do you draw on? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is why this conversation is so fun because I'm learning as I thought about it ahead of time, and I always learn with Heather. Um, so, you know, I think um, because academia is to repeat so hypercritical, so destroying of confidence over and over again. So, uh, women non-affirming, to put it mildly. So that's been a huge thing for me with my students to really affirm and draw out women and, and give them a sense of confidence, even though we all struggle with that. I do even to this day, you know, let's ad admit that. But I think I want to just make uh, an important point here. I'm very blessed to live with someone who's very positive, upbeat and affirming. And that's John Grimm. And I honestly, I, do, I could not have done this work without John. There's no question. I've already mentioned Thomas and Taird, but um, you know, he wakes up in the morning, he's in a good mood, goes to bed, he's in a good mood. He's, uh, he loves to garden and take walks and so on. So I sustain myself, of course, by this remarkable companionship. Every meal we're discussing, <laughs> some parts of it. So every email I send out, I check with him, you know, decisions and so on. So affirmation is part of, as I say, my larger family, my sister, John, this family, but I think how to sustain it is really the question. You really <laughs> nailed it, Heather. I mean, I have you know spiritual practice, as I'm sure most of you do, and I've got meditation in the morning, water in the four directions, and so on, which a Native American told us to do, lighting candles. So I've got a, this. I don't do anything before this spiritual practice, out with the sun, and so on, as much as I can in the morning, and then I journal. And the journal, I've got boxes and boxes of journals, to, to be honest, to say, how can we sustain this work despite the sad, bad news all around us? That is, it's true today, but it's been true for 40 years because of hearing Thomas 40 and 50 years ago, as Heather knows. So some way to sustain, not just a naive hope, um, but you know, a cosmic hope, if you will, uh, an ecological hope. And that's still a question for me every day. I go in there and I write about it. So, and then of course, you know, swimming and walking and the exercise, but the spiritual exercise, the journaling and physical exercise and friendship makes such a difference. Good answer. Thank you. Um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you have found the challenges of being such a leader, because I'm just reading over your CV again, you are called upon often to write, to speak, to give lectures, to do conferences and workshops. Um, so you are a recognized leader globally. Tell me what you, or tell us what you have found the challenges to be, to being such a leader. <laughs> emails <laughs> if we could introduce them i'd be so thrilled a good friend said years ago they fragment the mind right uh, you've got a request here and then another here and they fragment the mind so i think um the challenges are the demands hmm. in various forms and most of them are are good 
you know, had this one just this past week. This gentleman is living in Cancer Alley for years and years and years. He gives me all the problems in Cancer Alley in Louisiana, where the petrochemical wow. factories are creating absolute health hazards for land and people. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an example of this burgeoning, fortunately, environmental justice, right? Mm -hmm. And the stories are just bone chilling. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what we need is the universe story to change the story, to change the mindset, you know, of economic destruction of the environment, et cetera, is not the way to go. Now, this is a really important thing. I've been watching Cancer Alley for years and years. Unfortunately, I can't do it. So I'm trying to introduce him to people in the Louisiana, New Orleans area. Um, so the challenges are just the amount of requests. That's kind of for the movement, I would say, the, the force. The other, the field, I could spend the rest of the time talking about the challenges because um, we have had to be ninja. You know, the Japanese, they're all dressed in black and they sort of slide between the cracks of these um, bunraku poet uh, uh, puppets and so on, sliding between the cracks. We are ninja in a huge institution like Yale. And even when we were at Harvard, so under the radar screen, we didn't want to be, you know, up there because you get hammered down, as they say in Japan, if you do too much self-advertising. So and let me just be very specific and then stop for another of your good questions. I think the challenge in academia, we've been 50 years of teaching in secular academia. And secular academia has this, in case you haven't noticed, such an affinity to the separation of science and religion, of anything to do with spirituality and ethics, et cetera, is so on the margins, we don't want to talk about it. 50 years of this has been absolutely exhausting. But, and that's true in the schools that we've been part of at Yale, School of the Environment, highly scientific, reductionistic, no values, only facts. The Divinity School, Christian oriented for ministry, people oriented, social justice, of course, but no conversation really until very recently. So now we have, I think, a new possibility of science and religion emerging, which maybe I can talk about. Um, but that's been the biggest challenge, I would say, between those two schools. Oh, please, please say more about, um, you said you want to talk about a bit more about that. Please do. Well, yeah. Um, so it's something I want to write about more. When we, we went to this pre-COP conference for religious leaders in Abu Dhabi, and they asked us to speak on the science and religion, actually. So this is how it got started back in November of religious leaders who, by the way, from all over the world, Muslim world, et cetera, are absolutely on this case of climate change. They were not there 20 years ago. They're talking about moving beyond a human-centered <laughs> ethics even. It's, it was amazing. So there's good news coming up. So what my brief outline would be this. So the science and religion dialogue has had conflict from the beginning, although you can say some of the scientists like Newton and so on, very religious, but by and large, they were considered separate magisterium. That's the word that Stephen Jay Gould used, very separate at, at Harvard. But I think with this religion and ecology, all of a sudden people are realizing there's a common ground. Why? Between science and religion, ecology and ethics and so on. Because these various religions talk about interdependence, interrelationship, interbeing, like Thich Nhat Hanh. It's almost obvious now, but you can see how that's what inspires ecology, the relationality between plants and species and soils and ecosystems. How exciting. That's how it began. You see ecology with this tremendous thrill of studying this interdependence. And all of a sudden, a science ecologist will say, wow, well, that's what Buddhism's talking about too, the interdependence of things. So all of a sudden this is becoming more visible and people are 
um, I think, interested in exploring it in ways that they simply weren't before. Now, and that's true even on the universe story level, you know, uh, coming together. But then I think between the uh, division between science and religion, finding common ground around ecology and the future, I think now there's a third way forward. And it's even moving towards cooperation that we know we have the scientific facts on many of these problems, climate change, pollution, species extinction. So we've got the facts, we've got policy papers, we've got legal arms uh, working on this, we've got new economics, we've got technology emerging all over, solar, wind, and so on, but we still don't have the values, the, the cultural and spiritual shift where do, where do we ground ourselves, even if it's unstable and changing? We ground ourselves in this messy world of who we are as human. What's the meaning of things? And this, so these different religions and spiritualities that are the, the new spiritualities that are emerging of this kind of interdependence, be it Druidism and paganism and panentheism and pantheism, that we're part of some huge mystery. We go all the way back to Teilhard, divine milieu. So this possibility for cooperation, I think, is very hopeful if we keep steady, <laughs> if we keep patient um, and enduring. Uh, the next generation gets this. They understand it. They're trained differently. They're more open and <laughs> let's make the windows and doors wide open so they can go through. Lovely metaphor. <clears throat> uh, I just, I have a, a one more question, maybe a couple more, but uh, you wrote in the Deep Time Leadership Project, this is a quote from you, there's nothing more critical than leadership for our moment of transition to a flourishing future sink in and be deeply transformed. I found that a very beautiful phrase. Uh, do you want to say a bit more about that? There's nothing more critical than leadership for a moment of transition into a flourishing future. Sink in and be deeply transformed. Well, you know, I think we all have this capacity for leadership and we don't always see where we can make a difference. And everyone's like, what can I do? <laughs> um, but I think human creativity is so astonishing, really, that if we, the sinking into is not just individual creativity, but the creative powers of the universe that sustain us. You know, my sister sends these beautiful pictures of the sun rise near her. I'm like, electrified by it, you know, that we're drawing in somehow these energies as maybe never before in our life, because between COVID, the horrendous news all over the world, people are seeking new forms of creativity, participation, giving back. And the greatest, some of the greatest ways we can do it is through, um, the listening to, the attunement with, the alignment with the natural world. That's what Thomas was saying over and over again. This will feed us. And let me just give one specific example. I am so excited by this possibility of, again, the nature writing, religion, values, and science coming together. In this example, we know plants trees, forests, communicate. We have an explosion. We had 9,000 people on a webinar here at, at Yale discussing this, just that alone. We have knowing that animals communicate in their own ways, that they even have culture. Look what Jane Goodall has brought into our consciousness. The most famous scientist in the world because she understood relationality and communication. We've got migration patterns of birds, of turtles, of fish, of caribou up in your great northern parts of Canada. We have no idea fully how that actually happens. But what I'm saying is the differentiated 
sentience, intelligences in the natural world is beginning to impinge on us in exciting ways through the nature writers, through scientists studying this. And then all of a sudden, there are people there on the beaches helping the turtles <laughs> birth their young. There are people helping the red knot sandpiper come from Tierra del Fuego in the southern part of South America to Chesapeake Bay, eat the horseshoe crab eggs of a 500 million year old species, fly up to Canada, to James Bay, have their young, and their young fly back from James Bay on their own to Chesapeake Bay and all the way back to Tierra del Fuego. Now, if that isn't one of the great mysteries that we're just entering into, doesn't it light us up? Doesn't it give us that energy, that creativity to be leaders in our own way? And there's so many ways to do that. Um, I really appreciate what you're talking about, the different kinds of intelligence that in one sense, the second half of the 20th century brought it forward in a much more public way. I just want to mention, Mary Evelyn and I love a phrase by Gaston Bachelard called the intimate immensities. And every once mm -hmm. in a while, I, I look at, I, I look almost every day, actually, at the James Webb images, <laughs> James Webb telescope. But maybe you could reflect a bit on this term, intimate immensities, because uh, I know it's very meaningful to you. And I believe you draw on that as a leader. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I'm glad you brought him in because uh, he's <laughs> well, what an amazing person um, we can turn to. So intimate immensities, of course, I like to think from the telescope, you know, it's relatively modern invention, um, the telescope out there to the microscope right here. Um, all of a sudden, in 150 years, the expansion of our knowledge is just extraordinary. But keeping that connection to, I mean, the biochemical world has just exploded. Ursula Goodenough, one of our dear friends, cell biologists says, even the cell has a sense of self. That's amazing. You can watch it in the conversations in Journey of the Universe. And that sense of discernment she uses, even from the, the smallest, the complexity of a cell, the complexity of multicellular life, it's just mind boggling. These, you see, these will be our new meditations as we go forward. People are already developing rituals and meditations around these processes of nature. And Heather, I'm so glad you mentioned the Webb telescope. You know, Hubble was amazing because the Hubble telescope showed us that the universe, the galaxies are moving further and further apart. We're in an expanding universe. We didn't know that. That's, again, just over 100 years old. But now, with these web images, and I love that you look at them almost every morning. You know, when the scientists got these images back, and we know how long it took to build that telescope, how much it costs, and so on. But the scientists themselves were weeping with what they were seeing this incredible complexity over time that 14 billion year old universe has given rise to a life generating planet. It's astonishing. It's really astonishing. So I thank you for that beautiful word and example from the Webb telescope. Several people have posted questions and we are at 12.42. So do I give this over to Bianca for the Q&A part? Sure. So um, um, thanks, Mary Evelyn. And now other people have some questions they'd like to ask, and Bianca will moderate that. While she's doing that, I see one that's about Indigenous wisdom. So let me just, just jump in. Of course, my husband, John Grimm's specialty is Indigenous uh, peoples and we have a huge conference on that in the in the Harvard conferences and a book and so on. And we've had many years of experience with the Crow people, the Crow tribe in Montana, with the Sundance and other rituals. And so 
Thomas taught some of the first courses in this in 1976 in New York, and John has been uh, studying and teaching this for a very long time. So that is a huge part of our work. But most importantly, and why the question is so helpful, is this is exploding um, all around the world, really, certainly North America. And Robin Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, because finally people are realizing other people lived in relationality. So thank you so much for bringing that up. And while I I want to affirm and celebrate indigenous wisdom, I want to also say these forms of relationality are present also, especially in the Asian religions like Buddhism and Shinto and Confucianism. So thank you for that question. Bianca, over to you. <laughs> thank you for, for your answer, uh, Mary Evelyn. We appreciate that. And um I will I will now read some of the questions from the chat, but uh, please feel free to put up your hand if you have a question that you would like to ask um, in person, so to speak. Um, so I'll read from the bottom up. Uh, I had been intrigued uh, by Erwin Laszlo's The Intelligence of the Universe view that the universe has a consciousness of its own. Do you think that relatively recent acquisition of consciousness is something that the universe has called forth? Can non- theists resonate with such an idea by opening the possibility of intelligence emerging from other species from the planet itself, perhaps the cosmos as a kind of knowing? Well, Thomas, that's a great question. And Laszlo has been saying things like this for quite some time, along with quite a few others, I might say. So why is Teilhard so inspiring? Because Teilhard said from the very beginning, Spirit and matter were evolving over time. So you have galaxies and stars emerging because of self-organizing dynamics and emergent properties that would make a star coalesce into galaxies, something uh, smaller, less, less complex to something greater and, and more complex. So you see here, the question is, Baird understood that, um, and certainly Thomas did as well. So it's not, and your question doesn't suggest this, but sometimes people say, well, we've got to give rights to other species, or we've got to give a sense of consciousness to other uh, plants and animals. It's part of the whole process, but it's differentiated. You know, plants move towards the sun. They do photosynthesis, taking sunlight, making it sugar for energy. Unbelievable process. Very, very sophisticated. So I think the, this question is so important, but just to get to some others, I want to just say we don't have the full language to describe this yet, I think. Um, but we're on the verge because many people are thinking about it. And as we come to this sense of the deep relationalities in things, um, the inner and the outer. Whitehead understood this, you know, as well, relationalities. Um, we will, I think, have an even vaster ground for environmental ethics and action. That's the point. But we have to do it carefully. Here's the ninja in me. Being around scientists for so long, we don't want to alienate people by anthropomorphizing or humanizing um, either the universe or even the earth. So let's work together on getting the right language and listening to what the scientists are telling us about animal intelligences, because they're very multiple. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Now, as, as you answer, more questions keep coming. So I right. will choose some that, uh, that showed up a little bit earlier, and we may not have time for all the questions, but uh, I will try to do justice to as many as I can. Um, there is a, a question about um, the the aspect of, so E. Um, o. Wilson in his book, Consilience, talks about how we are drowning in, de in data while starving for wisdom. How can we shift from so much data to more wisdom? Yeah, I'm so glad you picked that up because my eyes popped into that too. <laughs> and, you know, Ed Wilson, a wonderful uh, entomologist, studied ants <laughs> at Harvard. Uh, and partly because he lost eyesight in one eye, so he had to look very carefully. He was a wonderful participant in these conferences at Harvard on religion and ecology. 
but he didn't, like many scientists, get the full understanding of what are religions. He was from a Baptist tradition. We said to him at lunch, Ed, Baptists are not the whole of the world's religions. But he was marvelous. He was so good and in dialogue with Thomas Berry and so on. But this book, Consilience, is really an important one to raise. So he's trying to argue we've got science and religion and maybe we'll come into some cooperation, as I was talking about. But that book and even his... his um, attitudes were still science is the way of knowing. Science is better. Religion, a little bit primitive, mythological, will pat you on the head and say it's okay. And see, this is what we have to overcome, even among the best scientists. And I say it with such respect for him, because your question points to this notion, facts are going to save us, the environment, the planet, future generations. I don't think so. And this notion that you're raising, what is wisdom? You, and the way we like to put it too, facts and values coming together. The science is very devoted to no values, all facts. So for, I would say for 20 years, we've had incredible climate change scientists giving us the facts, the data, the charts, the models, all from facts. It has not resonated with the values, the minds and hearts of people. And this is where we are now. We've got to put it back together again. And I take my hat off to Jim Hansen, who stepped out of that model of only facts and other scientists who are doing this kind of engaged work now. So it's not black and white and uh, it's happening. A new, a new consilience, I think. Great question. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask a question that is a little bit related from Amanda. The divide between science and religion is alive and thriving in academia, at least in the UK. And, and then she talks about her struggles to, to focus on her PhD doing research um, on this aspect. If you could talk about that a bit. Well, that's, um, that's exactly right. This is everywhere, this divide between science and religion. Um, that's what I was, you know, trying to to indicate earlier. Um, and you know, I think we have to kind of take a step back and say, why? What's the fear here? And we do have to acknowledge, we say over and over again in our religion and ecology work, we say religion has its problems and its promise. So we don't want to just beat up on scientists and say they got to get their act together. No, because we want to say religions have been often very conservative, fundamentalist. We have examples all over the world, including India and Modi and hyper uh, Hindu uh, BJP party and so on. So we have to be very careful and steady and astute to say religion has this potential to dynamize change and inspire people with an intergenerational handshake for the kind of future we want to create together. And it's taken such a long time, even for religions to get on board. So I want to just put that in the mix. But now scientists who are as concerned as we all are about the future are more open. Union of Concerned Scientists wants to be involved. Many of the environmental organizations here in the US, uh, Nature Conservancy and others, want this participation of people working on religion and ecology. So that's the good news. Academia is going to take a long, long time. That's all I can say over and over again. And um, yeah, but we've got to figure out the language, the intersections, and the projects that work together. World Resources Institute, one of the greatest policy institutes in the world, now has a section on ethics and religion. So we need to identify them and keep moving forward. Thank you. That's a, that's a really um, hopeful message to hear. Thank you for that. I will, um, I will now ask a question um, from uh, Carol. Um, she's asking, uh, what do you see as the role of, of how important are rituals in carrying the, the new story forward? And uh, she talks about her life work project at this time, evolutionary rituals for everyday emergence. 
Yeah, that's so good. Thank you, Carol. Um, because you know, Thomas Berry came out of a monastic order of monks where they prayed the office at dawn and dusk and several times during the day, the Benedictines do. This is the rhythm of the deep prayer of the Catholic Church. His sensibilities of the rhythms of nature and the cosmos, no question came out of that experience. Called, he talked about the cosmic liturgy. So what you're pointing to is our expansion of rituals from human salvation or human redemption to the placement within these great cycles of nature. Paul Winter's Earth Mass uh, for the Feast of St. Francis at the Cathedral St. John the Divine in New York for 40 years, maybe 35, they have the animals come in through the great doors. They have the, the songs of the birds. People are carrying their animals in there. This is one of the greatest liturgies that's transformed the whole idea of the Mass. And Paul, as we know, does this amazing winter solstice to celebrate the sun coming back. Thousands come to hear this. So we have things to build on, but the energy that's going in this direction of prayers, of rituals, of funerals, of rituals of regret, of sorrow, of repentance, and rituals of celebration. Amen. Let's go forward. Let's find our way. It's going to be imperfect, but we need to do that. And it is already happening um, to the great joy of people participating in it. Thank you. Um, maybe just one last question in the, in the last uh, few minutes that we have. Um, can you comment, this is a question from Craig, uh, on why is it that uh, those religions who view um, heaven, you know, in the clouds, seem to trash the planet with impunity, while those who see God or nature or, or Gaia as, as one wouldn't engage in such actions? Well, it's a great question. Um, I would nuance it a little bit because we have been saying things like that for some time. But, um, you know, the Chinese <laughs> traditions are incredibly nature-based and rich. And as I've said, cosmological. I, I mean, I had 50 students at 8 a.m. at Bucknell in a class on Confucianism. That's how eager they were to learn about it. So these are amazing traditions. But they have also, following <laughs> materialism, consumerism, the American dream, bigger is better, progressive economics, you know, the rest of the world is following, unfortunately, this truly distorted dream, which is why Thomas Berry said we need a new dream. And I take the U.S. to be hugely responsible for this massive materialist, consumerist culture. We're all swimming upstream because of this, but we have to keep swimming. <laughs> and what I want to say is, you know, the Chinese have had this tremendous industrial revolution, um, but they're very conscious of destroying their environment too. We were just there for three weeks in September. And you know what they're working on? And I take this to be so hopeful because it's already passing to the West. They have created what they call the aspiration for an ecological civilization. It's in their constitution. There are graduate programs training people to participate in the government from this perspective of ecological civilization. So it's very practical, you know, it's energy oriented, it's education oriented and so on, because they know what food safety means, what pollution of their soil and water means and their air. So that kind of transformation is very exciting. And it's why all the world's religions, I think, need to come back to the sense of the sacred universe, but the imminent sense of the spirit within everything. And many of you have commented on that in the chat. That's, it's not, sorry, it's not heaven out there. <laughs> it's not a God in the sky. It's a sacred universe. It's a divine milieu in which we dwell and have our being and purpose. And that's the great transition that we're in. And I want to give a big shout out again to Heather, 
for leading precisely that in much of her writing on cosmogenesis, and to all of you who are listening in, and I think are also in the same direction. But I look forward to learning from you, especially when I come up to Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Evelyn. It's been such a pleasure to listen to you. And I have been so deeply touched, especially by what, what you mentioned about the, the sinking into process of noticing the, the creative energies of the universe and how we can be fed by that in our own work as leaders or in our own creativity. And I, I will really stay with that. <laughs> And I will uh, pay more attention. So thank you very much. And thank you, Heather, for inviting Mary Evelyn. It's been such a privilege to, to be part of this conversation. And thank you, everyone, for being here and for your questions. Um, I would like to, um, before concluding, and um, to invite you to our next uh, Being a Leader event on February 28th um, this year it's with the Speaker of the House of Common Honorable uh, Greg Fergus. We will share more details with you by uh, email. We would also like to invite you to our school launch and Thomas Berry Award on March 22 and 23. We will be honored to be again with Mary Evelyn and, and also with her partner, John Grimm, here in Ottawa. So uh, please join us for that uh, auspicious event as well. And uh, wanted to mention that our new graduate programs in leadership ecology uh, and equity, and also the graduate programs in diversity, equity, and inclusions are now open. So we invite you to contact us for more information. You can follow us on social media to um, stay updated about the webinars, workshops, and activities of our School of uh, Leadership, Ecology, and Equity, um, and also the Providence uh, Institute for Transformative Leadership. So thank you very much everyone. And thank you, Mary Evelyn, for your wisdom. You would like to say something? Yes, please. Just very quickly. I'm so glad you mentioned Heather Eaton is getting the Thomas Berry Award on March 22nd for her extraordinary work <laughs> for decades uh, in the spirit of the great work. So I hope we all see you there. It's going to be in the evening, I believe, and more information will be coming out. But we're thrilled to present this Thomas Berry Award to Heather. Thank you, my friend, Mary Evelyn. And just, I know, Bianca, you'll say the last word, but just to thanks everyone for coming and thanks, Mary Evelyn, for the lovely conversation. And if you notice what's in the chat, everyone's writing extremely inspiring and important. And so just an enormous gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are energized for the rest of the day. Thank you very much, everyone. Take good care. <laughs>